Hello, and welcome to a special episode of the Mary Chain Markets podcast. Special because this is the inaugural episode. Welcome. Today is Tuesday, July 13th. My name is Mo Rahim, and if you're not aware, this is an exciting time to be an investor in the cannabis sector. There's a lot going on that investors have to pay attention to. Things are changing state to state at the federal level and abroad. And on top of all of that, the businesses operating in the sector are making moves, all of which I'll be talking about in future episodes, but suffice it to say, the market and its players continue to grow. Okay, so briefly about the show after we get off the ground here with some episodes dedicated to specific topics that will help lay the groundwork. More on that later. I'm going to try to make this a near daily podcast on the weekdays, Monday through Friday, and we'll see how that unfolds. It is a big market and the information streams are endless, so I will be doing my due diligence, but if it's a particularly slow day, I might take a day off here and there. Each episode, I'll be covering the biggest news, offering analysis, and with some success, hopefully, hosting interviews. But that all ultimately depends on the popularity of the podcast, so obviously, I'll be talking about the cannabis markets both at a macro level, as well as covering the companies that I think are the most important or most followed, though I don't doubt we will be touching on some of the smaller or private players, at least in a cursory manner going to talk more about what this channel is and isn't later on, but I think that's enough of an intro for now. All that being said, I'm hoping for feedback. It is really important to me. It's going to guide where this show goes. This is my first podcast. I've never done this before, so please, please share the, the direction you would like to see this take. It will definitely influence it, and it means a lot to me, so please take the time to do that. You can comment on this video. Send me an email at maryjanemarkets at gmail.com or send me a message on Twitter at MJMarkets. All right, so normally we just jump right into the news first, but like I mentioned, these first few episodes are going to be a little different. In this episode, I will be talking about what makes the sector an attractive space to invest in, or why I'm personally invested, why am I, I'm even making an entire podcast around it, how we got to the market landscape that we're in now, then a broad overview of the market itself, what the future might hold for us, and what I'll be discussing in episodes to come. There's a lot to unpack there. So let's jump into it. Currently, the two biggest risks in this sector come from the fact that it is still an illegal substance at the federal level in the United States, and the volatility of speculative high-growth stocks is much higher than mature companies or a stock market index. It is not out of the ordinary for the beta of a company in this space to be moderately above one or much, much higher. If you're not familiar with how beta works, it's just a measure of relative volatility of a stock over a period of time compared to the index. Typically here in the U.S., it's going to be the S&P 500. So if that is the index we're comparing volatility against, the beta of the index itself would just be one. And if the beta of, say, Tilray is 2.75, that means the stock in Tilray is 175% more volatile than the S&P 500. It's not always that drastic. You can find stocks with a beta of 1.1 or 1.3. So in those cases, they would be 10 and 30% more volatile, respectively, than the index. But you can see from this list here, the 52-week high and low range can vary quite greatly. I'm not saying that beta or volatility is an appropriate measure of risk, but just noting that there can be a lot of movement in the prices of these equities, and some people don't have the appetite for that. Now, I do think that the pros outweigh the cons here, and that the risks we just went over can actually be advantageous to an investor. I want to start by reading a few lines written by Howard Marks, an investor whom I greatly admire, in a book titled The Most Important Thing. Fairly priced assets will return fair returns. Our goal is to find underpriced assets. Where should we look for them? Things that are little known and not fully understood, fundamentally questionable on the surface, controversial, unseemly, or scary, deemed inappropriate for respectable portfolios, unappreciated, unpopular, and unloved. 
To sum up in one sentence, perception has to be considerably worse than reality. Reflecting on that, the cannabis sector is an inefficient market with incomplete information. Even though people have been consuming the substance for a long time, even basic information, like just how big the market is, is unknown. And this is great for an investor. If everything was known about this space, everyone would plug the same inputs into their valuation models and there would be a consensus on price. But that's not the case. And that uncertainty might be scary to some people, but I believe if we're able to think through this incomplete information, we can place values on these companies that we can be confident in and in turn find mispricings or undervalued companies to invest in. That is our whole job as investors. So we'll be going through some of those widely varying forecasts here. And I'm going to show you my analysis as well and just how I came to it. Furthermore, it is a complex space with different laws and regulations between countries and at the federal and state level in the US. There has been a grieve, excuse me, there has been a green wave in the recent past with more states legalizing in some capacity, but even full leg legalization between states differs in its specificities. And this makes it really advantageous for larger public companies who have the resources to effectively expand into those markets, hire employees and lawyers to adhere to the specific laws of that jurisdiction, build out the infrastructure to be vertically integrated or acquire the smaller operators, accumulate licenses and permits, and capture market share. All of that complexity is good for big multi-state operators and in turn good for their investors. Another big reason to pay attention to the space right now is because legalization only happens once. We're in this unique moment in history where we are living through the widespread acceptance and legalization of this substance. And once we go through this phase and this becomes a mature market, we're never going to have the same opportunity that we have now. That might sound a little salesy, but it's an obvious truth that we have to acknowledge. And I think because of some of the things that I mentioned up until now and the fact that cannabis is still taboo in some circles, we don't see widespread investment or coverage in this sector. And that's actually a good segue into why I started the podcast in the first place. As I said before, I've been an investor in this space for a few years now. I've been keeping up on news and developments of companies in my watch list, watch the rise and fall of Canada's legalization, and the development of the U.S. market through Google, a couple of subreddits, other podcasts, websites, and of course any information put out by the companies themselves. And I've never quite come across the level of fundamental analysis that I've personally wanted as an investor, which makes sense to some degree. A lot of sources of information are news-driven. They're put out by news outlets, so we're all racing to just get information out there as fast as possible. And although there is a large community on Reddit, the quality of the analysis and conversations vary. Just the nature of social media, especially this year. And you can't really tell enthusiasts who have been making a specific type of content for a while now what to do on their show. So hopefully I can help fill the gap. I don't mean to bash on anyone contributing to the space. Multiple perspectives or different types of content are a good thing. Uh, to put it another way, aside from actually digging into the company filings themselves, I don't think there's a source where people can find consistently sound, level-headed, fundamental analysis, discussion, and news of this space. And I do believe it is possible to make a channel like that. I listen to some in other spaces that are excellent. So hopefully this will be a way for people and investors specifically to keep up with the sector and companies, what's going on, successes, risks, and opportunities. So this podcast is going to be looking from a fundamentally driven perspective and investing strategy at the sector. What you won't find here is technical analysis, discussion of, of charts, buy and sell recommendations, um, get rich quick FOMO hype or hype in general. That's just not my investment style or philosophy. I don't want to get caught up in the cultural aspects of this. I want to approach this as a rational investor. So just a bit of background on the space for anyone new coming into this. Obviously, marijuana has been around forever. This isn't a new product or an industry that needs to seek out customers. 
the black market has been thriving for a long, long time. It was only in 1970 that it became illegal in the United States under the Controlled Substances Act and classified as a Schedule One substance, which means it was determined to have a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. We started seeing the first real wave of acceptance in the early to mid 2010s, so fairly recently when the state started to approve medical programs, though there are standouts which have had medical programs and even decriminalized much, much earlier. But prior to the last decade, that was very much the exception and not the norm. That was partly because of the Cole Memo issued in 2012 under the Ab Ab excuse me, in 2012 under the Obama administration, basically saying that the federal government would not have as a priority the pers prosecution of individuals who are acting in compliance with state laws. That held up under the Trump administration, and it's holding up under the current one as well. And now it seems like dominoes falling. We're seeing the that medicinal has become the norm and recreational laws are passing as well. To give you some numbers to put this into context, 36 U.S. states have a medicinal program in place, though a good piece of those are CBD only, and 18 states have legalized recreationally. The two remaining states, Idaho and Nebraska, still prohibit use of any kind, although Nebraska has decriminalized. Looking briefly globally, since this podcast is aimed toward North American investors, some of us may have the opportunity to invest in companies that are outside of the U.S., such as Canada, where it is federally legal, and in turn, those companies can enter foreign markets. We should be aware that legalization is definitely the exception. Only a handful of countries have legalized, however, a decent number of countries across South America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and others have medical programs. I'm not sure how much I plan on focusing on those markets. The U.S. is a complex enough landscape itself, but this may end up being an inevitability as we see North American companies doing deals overseas. So, turning our attention back to the U.S. and Canadian market, first I want to address what seems to me like an unreasonable, maybe even irrational wide discrepancy in popularity between the Canadian operators and the U.S. operators. I have a hunch this is because this sector attracts younger investors, many of whom are on Robinhood, where you can trade Canadian names but not U.S. names which trade over the counter, which is something Robinhood doesn't offer, but other trading platforms like TD Ameritrade do. Uh, Canada has a population of 38 million people and a GDP of 1.2 trillion US dollars. In comparison, California itself has a population of 39 million people and a GDP of 3.2 trillion dollars. So there exists just one state in the US with a legal market that is bigger than the entire country of Canada. I'll pause there to let you absorb that. Now, there are reasons to invest in the Canadian LP. I'm not saying that there aren't. Their ability to make deals in foreign countries or the possibility that they're allowed to expand into the U.S. itself if federal legalization occurs and allows for that. But because of the sheer size of the U.S. market and that the trend seems to be toward recreational, meaning that new markets are going to keep coming online, and the potential market that MSOs can go after keeps getting bigger, sure seems to me that the U.S. is the more attractive market. And I think if you're one of those people that are solely on Robinhood and not investing in U U.S. operators, either because you don't want to switch platforms or pay a small fee for buying over-the-counter, you're doing yourself a huge, huge disservice. Digging a little bit into this, as I alluded to earlier, there isn't a lot of hard data on this market. Certainly a few years ago, I saw widely ranging numbers being thrown out, sometimes by CEOs or in prospectuses about total addressable market sizes that, frankly to me, seemed to either way underestimate or way overstate the potential market size. More recently, as more states have adopted medicinal or recreational programs, these MSOs started 
operating in them and the states have started reporting on things like sales and tax revenues, we've started to get a better idea on the legal market size and I've started seeing some estimates or forecasts that are in a reasonable ballpark. The forecasts are really hard to make and if you're just seeing it as a headline in the news and aren't given context into how that figure was reached, I'm not sure what good it does you as a rational investor who should scrutinize information that you come across. So I have decided to come up with my own bottom-up forecast that I use in my valuations, which I haven't updated in a while, but will hopefully be helpful in this discussion as illustration. And we'll quickly go through that now. The first thing you should know, though, is that no one has a definite answer to this. If you've been doing valuation for a while, then you've learned that no one knows the exact true value of a company, especially a high growth company, but you can be reasonably confident that the value lies in a certain range and this is going to be similar. So just some general information here is the population of the US, around 329 million people with an adult population of around 250 million people. First, I had to figure out how many adults use cannabis and what their average spend is. If we can estimate these two things, we can estimate the size of the market. Obviously, this is going to vary widely, person to person. So I chose a wide range of 30, excuse me, of 10 to 30% based on a number of polls and surveys. But to be honest with you, I'm skeptical of these polls. They survey a relatively small number of people and I don't think people are entirely honest when asked about these topics. And they all report um, on these statistics and define use differently. Um, the most recent Gallup poll puts it at 12%. A national survey conducted by multiple government agencies and institutes like the HHS and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration put this at around 19%. The Statistica Research Department reports this between age ranges, putting it at 22% for 18 to 29 year olds, and then 11 to 12% for 30 to 64 year olds. And this right here might be a point of contention for some. Depending on who I talk to, this range will either be too low or too high. And I think this is just comes from everyone's own individual context of what they observe in the people around them. If we're being conservative, which I like to be, then we can use these lower percentages. But I think leaving in the higher end of this range leaves room for our market size to accommodate for non-regular users, people who just want to have fun on the weekend or something like that, or new adopters. I'm sure legalization will widen the acceptance of use of the substance and will create an opportunity for people to try it for the first time when the stigma is taken out of it. And of course, uh, medical patients who would normally be prescribed a different type of medication now being given a medicinal card. On the other hand, another Gallup poll says two in three Americans support recreational federal legalization. So there could certainly be a surprise to the upside. And similarly, I had to decide how much users spend monthly. We can get an idea from quarterly filings where companies might report average spend of customers or patients or revenue and customers. They're these might seem kind of high, depending on where you're located or where you buy from. They were shocking to me. But if you've never been to a dispensary in most parts of the country, the prices are quite high, certainly higher than what's on the black market. So I've used a wider range here of $150 to $300. And again, some people might disagree with this. These are the values that I've chosen to go with. And if I reveal the whole table, you can see that this matrix ranges from 45 billion to 270 billion. That's a very wide range. And you can eyeball here yourself on the numbers that you had in your head while we were talking about this, on what you think the market is. But 
we don't want to let our personal biases drive our valuations. So from here, I ran a few Monte Carlo simulations. If you're not familiar with this method, from a range of values like these, we can take the mean and standard deviation and then run a large number of simulations to get a distribution. So I ran 10,000 simulations. So 10,000 times the computer picked a value for a percent of population, given a mean and standard deviation, and a value for monthly spend, given a mean and standard deviation, and plotted a distribution. So let's look at that now. Here is a histogram of monthly spend, and it looks like the mean is between 220 to $230, and right below that, hopefully you can see this on the share. So right below that is a histogram of percent of users, and that one looks like it's right around 22, 23%. And lastly, here is a histogram of the market size based on the two previous Monte Carlo simulations. One thing that is noticeable here that isn't in the others is that this is a gamma distribution. So it doesn't look like a, a normal distribution curve. Gamma distributions are used in finance all the time. We won't go into the, the specific details, but the distinguishing, at least visibly distinguishing, characteristics that tell you it's a gamma distribution are that all of the values are greater than zero and there is this long tail of values on the right both of which are obvious traits if you're simulating a market you can't have a market that's less than zero and the the potential for the market to be greater is, is skewed so let's summarize that back in this table here My Monte Carlo simulations are telling me that the market size is around $152 billion. That's the total market. My, a monthly spend is around $224, and the percent of users is around 22%. So if you disagree with the ranges I use, you can use different values for yourself. Or if you do agree with the ranges, but not necessarily the market size, I use, then this table and distribution shows you the probability of the market being the size that you think it is. There are definitely some cons to using a Monte Carlo simulation, and to be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of these. When you take a look at the average market size over my 10,000 simulations, you see it's pretty close to just taking the average of both of my inputs and multiplying those out. So it's pretty obvious conclusion that the average times the average is the average. And this is obviously going to skew as we change our inputs. So if we used a lower range for a percent or a lower or higher monthly spend, then this average would respond accordingly. So I think the, the biggest benefit we get from going through this exercise is that if we're comfortable with our range of inputs, then we can say that we're 68 or 95 or 99% confident that the market size is in a certain range. So that's just something to be aware of if you have exposure to these simulations elsewhere. Next, I wanna go over how we can assess the potential state-by-state -state market opportunities as they come online or a company you're following enters that state. So this spreadsheet here shows a list of each US state along with their GDP. So with this, we can really tell how big or small some markets are, and that is going to help us with our projections later on when, we, when it comes to forecasting out revenues and whatnot. For example, if we know a company operates in Utah, Nevada, and Kansas versus another company that operates in New York, Florida, and Illinois, we could reasonably say that at least the potential for future revenues is higher for the company operating in those larger markets. Obviously, there is more to it than that, but that is, the, that is an important point of consideration. So moving along, I don't think it's a big leap to, excuse me, I think my audio cut out. Let me backtrack here. I don't think it's a big leap to assume that the 
distribution of the cannabis market will be similar to GDP. Of course, it's not going to line up one to one, and we'll see that very clearly, but you can think through why the reasons that contribute to a state's GDP will hold up for the potential cannabis market in that state as well, be it population sizes or that the state att attracts more tourists, etc. And all I've done here in this column is take the 152 billion average market size we calculated and distributed that among the states in proportion to their GDP. And then we can start looking at data coming out of each state. Uh, you'll have to pardon me here. This is a I completed the spreadsheet a, a while ago. Back in late 2020. So these numbers are not accurate for the year of 2020, but just what I had projected in sales for each state. But month to month, as that data comes out, we can see just how well this lines up, at least for the recreational states, since that would reflect the totality of the legal market in that state at that time, as opposed to a medicinal-only state where those numbers aren't representative of the whole potential legal market. That is an important distinction, but we do have to bring those medicinal numbers into our models. Obviously, if a state is not legalized, the potential legal market in that state is zero. Or if a state is medicinal only, like we talked about, or has just recently passed a law, these numbers will be drastically lower than the potential. But we can keep updating this as medicinal programs grow, more states come online, we start getting better data because ultimately that's what's going to help us most in making predictions and accurate valuations. So in green are recreational states, blue are medicinal. Anywhere you, where you see uh, zero stars or red are states that have medicinal programs that are only for CBD or they're prohibition states, so I haven't counted those. So let's just walk through one or two of these so it's super clear. So California here has a GDP of around $3.2 trillion. That's 14.6% of GDP. So I've taken 14.6% of the $152 billion total cannabis market and the potential total market in that state is $22 billion. And at the time, the numbers that were coming out of the state told me that they were going to finish off the year with around $4 billion in sales. I think in actuality, they finished in, at around 4.2 or 4.4, something like that. I have to go back and update this. If we look at another state, my home state of Illinois had a GDP of around $908 billion. 4.2% of total GDP and 4.2% of $152 billion market is around $6.4 billion. I think they finished off 2020 with around $1 billion in sales. Jumping down to Colorado, which is one of the more mature markets, they have a GDP of 396 billion, that's 1.8% of total GDP, and that puts their total market size at around 2.7 billion. And I was projecting that they were going to finish off the year at just over $2 billion in sales. And a, a, a state like Colorado is where I start to gain some confidence in my assumptions because Colorado is one of the more mature markets. We have a history of sale numbers that we can analyze. They've gone through a lot of the growing pains. So a state like Colorado or Oregon is a lot closer to reaching their potential total market size than a state like Illinois, which just went fully recreational last year. And you might say at this point that California has also been legal for a while. But we keep seeing reports of how the illegal dispensaries in that state 
dwarf the legal ones. And uh, that's a good segue to pausing to recognize that we're talking about a few different distinct concepts here. The total market is made up of the black market and the legal market. And since we've estimated the total market and have gathered data on the current legal market using the numbers that are coming out of those states, whatever is left over is demand that's being served in the black market. And we can see that the legal market is just a small portion of the total estimated market right now. So let's switch back to our other spreadsheet and let's make some projections about the future. Today in 2021, we've estimated the market size to be 152 billion. And we can assume that this market overall is mature, right? This is not a new substance. And we would expect this market to grow at a mature market rate of 1.415%, which is fairly low, very low. If you're wondering where I got that number, this isn't the place to go over how to perform evaluation, but you can reach out and I can give you a more detailed answer. So if I project this out 10 years, I can fill in my table as such. And then, let me do this real quick. And then from our previous spreadsheet, I've taken the numbers coming out of the recreational and medicinal states to get to the potential legal market size. And we can see as a percentage that is fairly small. Looking forward to what the ten next 10 years might hold for us, we could see every state become recreational. That certainly seems to be the trend or that it happened at the federal level. That seems possible, even plausible, maybe even probable. That would certainly bring into play the total market, but it's too optimistic to forecast that we convert the entirety of the black market to the legal market. Living in a recreational market myself, I can attest to the fact that there are people that still buy on the black market, and there are good reasons for that. Things like quantity and SKU limits, prices, dispensary locations, but the main reason is definitely price. A uh, rational consumer is not going to pay $60, 60 plus dollars, for an eighth at a dispensary if they can get it for $40 on the black market. And prices will definitely have to come down if companies have any hope of converting black market sales to legal sales. I think there are market dynamics that are going to fight that. That's a longer discussion we aren't going to get into here because we're already running way longer than I wanted to. But it is something that is worth talking about if we want to fully understand this market. Part of that is going to depend on how states structure their programs, how much they tax, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we're at a point where we have to make assumptions about how much of this total market we can convert to the legal market. Whatever this estimate of conversion is, we're going to be wrong about it. But we need a starting point. And we'll continue to update this, and it'll become more accurate as we get more data. When I have to do this, I like coming up with a range of values or being conservative, because that way, if on conservative assumptions a particular stock looks attractive to me, then I know when I run the model on more optimistic assumptions, it's going to look even better. So I've modeled out that by 2031, we're able to convert 45% of the black market to legal. Again, you may have differing opinions about this and that's okay. Everyone has to do their own valuation, but this is the starting point that I'm gonna use and we'll revisit this figure to update it in future episodes or reference it when we get to valuations. But based on another Monte Carlo simulation, 
that is what the math is telling me. And this looks like a pretty good starting point to me. We're going from a total market here in the year 2021 of $152 billion. That's going to grow at a rate about one, of 1.4% 1 to $175 billion in the year 2031. The potential legal market right now I'm thinking is around 16.6 .6 billion. That's only 10 or 11% of the potential legal market. Excuse me, potential total market. And that's going to grow to about 45% of the potential total market to $78 billion. And just for fun, I've calculated year-over-year -year growth rates on that. Obviously, as it's growing from a smaller base, these numbers are going to look really good. But the bigger it gets, the relative growth is going to slow down. And this projection out into the future was going to be a segue into my next topic about what the future might hold for us and discussing things like, is cannabis a commodity? and why that matters. If it is an explanation on how that would have an effect on prices, companies, and profitabilities, excuse me, and profitability. And as investors, we can't turn a blind eye to that. So we'll save that for a future episode. Also coming in future episodes, I will be giving a broad overview of the players and then perhaps dive deeper into individual companies, certainly not all of them. At some point, I also want to analyze prices from the supply side and how that would affect the market. But as quickly as I can, I'll be providing analysis and commentary on a regular basis as the industry develops, laws pass, dispensaries open, and of course, earnings are released. The idea is, is to have a 10 to 15 minute podcast that people know is coming regularly. So if there is news on a certain day that people are interested in, then they know I'll be covering it in depth and offering my analysis. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. In future episodes, it will be less personal detail and more analysis. A uh, little bit of background on me. I didn't mention this earlier, but I didn't mean to. I got my degree in economics here in Chicago, Illinois, where I live and work in tech. So valuation and financial analysis is not my day job. But I think that's important for you to know. And it is a big interest of mine. I don't work in finance or the cannabis space, so my perspective is going to be different from others that you might come across, but I think that is a good thing. It's good to hear from different perspectives, perhaps especially one that is not caught up in the enthusiasm for or disdain against the industry. My state flipped over to recreational starting January 1st of last year, so I'm able to observe how that's unfolding firsthand and in real time. So that's all I really have for today. If you guys like what you've heard and want to see this podcast continue, the best thing to do right now is to go ahead and like and subscribe. That'll help you see future episodes show up in your feed. And then it really does go a long way in helping me get the word out on the podcast, getting more listeners so that we can keep this thing going. That's all I really ask for at uh, this point in time. It would be extremely helpful. The best way to get in touch is to contact me on Twitter at mjmarkets or email me at maryjanemarkets at gmail.com. I also set up a Patreon. I don't expect any contributions after one episode, certainly, but if you decide that you are liking the podcast at a later date, feel free to check out that Patreon page at patreon.com slash maryjanemarkets. I don't think YouTube or other platforms are going to mon monetize my podcast because of the topic. All right, that's it. And hopefully I'll be speaking to you guys soon on the next episode of Mary Jane Podcast. <laughs> Mary Jane Markets. Thank you. I'll get better at this audio recording stuff, I promise.